Hello, my name is Steve and welcome to American Steam Legacy. This video is part two of a six-part series dedicated to the white notation. We'll be taking a brief look at the eight coupled locomotives of the white notation and some of the more noteworthy locomotives of each type. This is by no means an exhaustive collection of eight coupled locomotives, so if there is a wheel configuration you'd like covered in a future video, please leave a comment down below. So coming up next are the more noteworthy eight coupled locomotives of the white notation on American Steam Legacy. As railroad cars became heavier in the late 19th and early 20th century, the need for more powerful locomotives was not limited to just mainline power. The need for heavier switch and transfer locomotives became evident due to rail cars being shuffled around in classification yards to a far greater extent than we see today. Due to the limitations of the six-coupled switcher, the eight-coupled switcher would not only become an attractive solution to the problem, but would also enjoy the longevity that was denied its little brother, the 060. The first 080 locomotive to operate in the U.S. was designed and built by Ross Winans in 1844 for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Since the Baltimore and Ohio was the first American railroad to operate the type, the 080 wheel configuration could have become known as the Baltimore type. However, this eight-coupled locomotive would remain nameless and simply be referred to as a switcher type. The advent of the 080 wheel arrangement did not come from a need for a heavy switch or transfer locomotive, but instead a heavy freight locomotive. The eight coupled locomotives designed and built by Ross Winans for the Baltimore, Ohio were geared locomotives of an unorthodox design, with seven of them being rebuilt along conventional lines over the next 12 years. Winans' reputation for being hot headed and stubborn caused his popularity with the Baltimore and Ohio to fade even more quickly than that of his locomotives, causing the Baltimore and Ohio to look elsewhere. In 1847, Baldwin delivered the first of six eight-coupled freight locomotives of a mostly conventional design featuring horizontal boilers and inclined cylinders. The locomotive, named Dragon, featured a flexible beam design which allowed the first two set of drive wheels to move slightly crosswise to the locomotive's frame to aid in negotiating curves. By 1850, five more would arrive. Memnon, pictured here, and Saturn, both built by Newcastle Manufacturing, Lion, Giant, and Hero, built by the Baltimore and Ohio, all of which without the flexible beam design. These eight coupled locomotives proved to be effective in heavy freight service, albeit at relatively low speeds. They could handle a 160 ton train at 15 miles per hour on level track. While locomotives like the General and the Texas would be remembered by history for the Great Locomotive Chase on April 12, 1862, Memnon was quite quietly earning a reputation of its own. Memnon was singled out for praise during the American Civil War for its service to the Union Army, earning the nickname Old War Horse for hauling troops and supplies. Memnon would remain in service until 1892 and is only one of a handful of surviving original locomotives that served during the Civil War and the last surviving locomotive built by Newcastle Manufacturing. Memnon has been declared a National Historic Landmark for its service during the Civil War. Today, Memnon is on static display at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. By the early 20th century, the 080 wheel arrangement had been well established as a switch and transfer locomotive type. In 1914, the Washington Southern Railroad had the Richmond Works of Alco construct two eight-coupled switchers which would later serve as the basis for the USRA heavy switcher produced during the U.S. involvement in World War I. Of the 12 USRA locomotive types, the 080 would prove to be the most enduring, with a slightly modified version of the design lasting until the end of the steam era. In 1929, the Chesapeake and Ohio ordered 65 eight-coupled switchers that were modernized versions of the USRA design. These locomotives were the first of the Chesapeake and Ohio's C-16 class, which would eventually grow to 125 units. In 1949, the Chesapeake and Ohio placed their first order for Alco S2 diesel switchers, which meant the C-16 class was soon to become surplus. Fifteen C-16s received from Baldwin in 1943 were put up for sale on the used locomotive market, and the Norfolk and Western Railroad, still completely dedicated to steam, was all too happy to buy them at rock-bottom prices. 
The Norfolk and Western, being very pleased with the former Chesapeake and Ohio engine's performance, built 45 virtual duplicates, which would become the S1A class in 1953. The last locomotive of this class, number 244, built in the Norfolk and Western Roanoke shops, would be the last steam locomotive built for service on a U.S. common carrier railroad. Unfortunately, none of the S1A class switchers were preserved. 280, also known as the Consolidation, has a backstory that no one would associate with a successful locomotive design. As a late bloomer that was brought into the world by a difficult birth, the consolidation would in part lead to the 10-wheeler falling out of favor and the 262 bit prairie being put out the pasture sooner rather than later. Just about every source credits Alexander Mitchell for having designed the first true 280. And while this is true, the story of the 280 wheel configuration actually begins with the Pennsylvania Railroad. In 1864 or 1865, Pennsylvania modified a flexible beam 080 built by Baldwin in 1854 into a 280 by installing a non-driven wheel set under the front end of the locomotive. The result differed from what the 280 type would eventually become in two primary aspects. First of all, this was a tank engine. Water was held in a tank that straddled the boiler, while the fuel was held in a small coal space behind the cab. Secondly, the newly installed pilot wheels were not carrying a swiveling pilot truck, but instead were attached directly to the frame. While the Pennsylvania Railroad would eventually roster a fleet of consolidations, they would be of a conventional design featuring a swiveling pilot and a tender. While the Pennsylvania Railroad was tinkering with an existing locomotive, Alexander Mitchell, a master mechanic with the Lehigh and Mahanoy Railroad, was drawing up plans for a freight locomotive that could handle coal trains up to 300 tons on steep grades and could do so at higher speeds. The 080 type could do the job, but they were painfully slow when hauling this much tonnage. Mitchell believed the 280 would meet the, his railroad's requirements. All he needed was someone to build it. His initial attempts at convincing Baldwin to build the prototype were rebuffed, since Baldwin didn't exactly warm to the idea of building a locomotive designed by someone other than their own engineering department. But through persistence and negotiation, Baldwin eventually capitulated and delivered Mitchell's new locomotive in 1866. While Baldwin was building the locomotive, Mitchell's railroad merged with the Lehigh Valley Railroad. In recognition of this corporate union, Mitchell named his new engine Consolidation. The name caught on and the 280 has been known as the Consolidation ever since. The Lehigh Valley Railroad's management was pleased with Mitchell and his creation. Mitchell would go on to be master mechanic of the Mahanoy division, but the 280 wheel configuration would remain rather obscure for the next 10 years. In 1875, the Pennsylvania Railroad adopted the type in earnest and other railroads began to take notice. Thousands would be built and the consolidation became the premier freight hauler nationwide. The 280 would remain in production for the next 50 years with nearly 33,000 being built, 23,000 for domestic railroads and 10,000 more for export. The 12-wheeler gained some popularity among American railroads but was relatively rare compared to the American, the 10-wheeler and the consolidation. As a more powerful version of the 10-wheeler, the 12-wheeler's long wheelbase and light axle loading made it suitable to operate on track with rail as light as 90 pounds per foot. The 12-wheeler was manufactured mostly between 1890 and 1920, with fewer than 1,000 being produced. The origins of the 12-wheeler date back to 1855, when the Baltimore and Ohio began construction of a 480 named Centipede. Centipede was initially a cab-forward design with a cab mounted ahead of the boiler. The locomotive didn't fully enter service until 1864 after being modified to a camelback with a cab straddling the midsection of the boiler. Centipede would go on to serve in this configuration for nearly 20 years. The first standard 12-wheeler appeared in 1882 when the Central Pacific Railroad began testing the type on the steep mountain grades of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. After realizing the 12-wheeler could outpull other freight locomotives of the period, namely the 10-wheeler, the road would go on the roster over 80 units. Most of these locomotives would be built by either the Schenectady Works or Cook, two of the builders that would later merge to form the American Locomotive Company, or ALCO. The 80 12-wheelers would comprise classes TW1 through TW8. The TW2, TW3, and TW8 classes featured a cross-compound steam distribution where the high-pressure cylinder on one side of the locomotive would exhaust to a low-pressure cylinder on the opposite side. The TW2 and TW3 classes would eventually be simpled, meaning the steam is only expanded once before being sent to the stack around the turn of the 20th century. While the cross compounds of the TW8 class would undergo the same conversion by 1911. It was the Norfolk and Western that would not only amass the largest fleet of 12-wheelers, but also some of the heaviest ever built. 
In 1906, the Norfolk and Western received their first 125 12-wheelers built by Alco and Baldwin. Designated the M-Class and referred to as Mollies, these locomotives impressed the Norfolk and Western with their pulling power and smooth riding qualities. In 1907, another 100 units would arrive and comprise the M1 class. These engines were about 2,000 pounds lighter and had a shorter overall wheelbase. The biggest difference was the M1s came with a tender with a loaded weight of 50,000 pounds less than those of the preceding M class with a water capacity reduced from 9,000 gallons to 6,000. 1910 saw the arrival of the 61 units of the M2 class. The 9,000 gallon capacity tender made a return appearance and the engine weight was increased substantially to just under 220,000 pounds, a gain of 56,000 pounds over the preceding two classes. The total weight of the engine and tender combined was 428,000 pounds, making the M2s the heaviest 12-wheelers built to date. The M2s became unpopular due to poor riding characteristics and poor steaming capacity attributed to an undersized firebox. Eleven of the M2 class locomotives would be fitted with superheaters at the N&W Roanoke shops to rectify the steaming problem. The M2C class, as they would be known, would be the heaviest 12-wheelers ever built, weighing in at 447,000 pounds. While the 12-wheeler fell out of favor with every other railroad that owned them, the Norfolk and Western would keep theirs in operation well into 1950s. Fortunately, several examples of the 12-wheeler survive today, with one still operating on the Strasburg Railroad in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. What do the names Mikado, Mike, McAdoo, and MacArthur have in common? If you guessed a law firm, you're way off. If you guessed a comedy act, well, you're a little closer, because Gilbert and Sullivan's comedy opera called The Mikado was still very popular at the time the 282 wheel arrangement began its rise to stardom in the late 1890s. The first 282s were built by the Lehigh Valley Railroad in 1883 by converting a pair of 210 zeros to 282 configuration. Even though these conversions were oddballs and never duplicated, they are worth mentioning since they were the first of the type. Baldwin began manufacturing the 282 in the early 1890s for export markets first Mexico, then more notably to Japan in 1897. The first American standard gauge Mikados were built by Baldwin for the Bismarck, Washburn, and Great Falls Railroad in 1903, while the first large order for domestic 282s came in 1905 when the Northern Pacific ordered 20 from the Brooks Works of Alco. By then, the 282 wheel configuration was so heavily associated with Japan, the type was named Mikado, which means emperor in Japanese. After the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, some American railroads referred to the type as MacArthur's after the famous General Douglas MacArthur. Of the railroads that did adopt this new moniker, it didn't stick for very long and the 282 would be generally referred to as Mike. The American Mikado shares a dual lineage. The early Baldwin Mikes were adapted from the very successful 280 consolidations that the company was already producing, while the Northern Pacifics were an adaptation of the 262 Prairie of which the railroad maintained an extensive fleet. Whatever the case, it didn't take long for American railroads to see the merit of the 282 as a heavy freight locomotive. Its flexibility, power, and relatively light axle loading made it the premier freight hauler on American railroads, replacing the venerable 280 consolidation, which had been the standard American freight locomotive since 1880. The Mikado may not have been the most produced type, at approximately 9,000 being built for domestic service, but it did outnumber the Mountain, Berkshire, Santa Fe, Texas, and northern types combined. The mic also holds the distinction of remaining in production the longest, with the last examples being built as late as 1949. By 1916, the eve of the U.S. entry into World War I and the nationalization of the nation's railroads, the production figures for American locomotives show just how popular the mic had become. 731 Mikados had been built that year, with six-coupled switcher coming in at a distant second at 402, the once standard freight hauler, the Consolidation, ranked last with only 63 being produced. By 1917, the Mike's popularity had grown to the point that when the idea of standardizing locomotive designs during the war was first broached, the president of the New York Central, A.H. Smith, an advisor to the USRA, suggested building a fleet of 1,000 Mikes as part of a national locomotive pool. Plans were drawn up for a light Mikado with an axle loading of 55,000 pounds, and the first USRA light Mikado, Baltimore and Ohio, number 4500, was completed on July 4, 1918. No other USA locomotive had been completed this early. Alco completed their first batch of government Mikados, as they were also known, in August, and by September, some six and eight-coupled switchers had appeared.
The basis for the USRA Mikado was probably the Santa Fe 3160 class and the Pennsylvania Railroad's L1S class. The Santa Fe and the Pennsylvania Mikes were nearly identical in boiler pressure, cylinder diameter, tractive effort, and weight, but the Pennsylvania Railroad Mikes featured the Belpair firebox for which the Pennsylvania Railroad preferred. Since both classes had already proven themselves successful designs by 1917, it's no wonder the USRA would look to them for a design to standardize. The USRA Mikado came in a light and a heavy version, just as the other five USRA standard locomotives. The light Mikado's firebox shared the same dimensions with the USRA Light Pacific, as did the heavy Mike and the heavy Pacific. However, the boilers would differ only in diameter, 90 inches on the light Mike and 96 inches on the heavy, while the boiler length would remain the same. While both versions shared the same pilot, they did not share the same trailing truck. After the USRA was dissolved, the standard mics would not only continue in service, but nearly identical copies would be built for not only the railroads that operated the USRA Mikados, but also for railroads that adopted the type after World War I. The standard USRA design would survive for the next 25 years, with modern appliances being added such as feed water heaters, disc-type drive wheels, and a second air pump, among other things. Even though the Mikado would eventually be overtaken by the 284 Berkshire as a heavy, fast freight locomotive in the 1920s, its longevity can be attributed to the USRA standard and the railroads that operated successful 282s prior to World War I. In 1924, Lima introduced the 284 wheel configuration, and it would ultimately render all previous freight locomotive designs obsolete. From the very beginning, railroads tried to squeeze as much power as possible from each new locomotive design, but always ran into the same two constraints. The existing railroad infrastructure's ability to handle the ever heavier locomotives and a fireman's ability to shovel enough coal into the firebox to maintain boiler pressure. The end of World War I and the eventual dissolution of the USRA, returning railroads to private sector control, proved to be a mixed blessing. The wear and tear inflicted on the railroads and the lack of maintenance while under USRA control led to the need for a massive post-war modernization of railroad infrastructure specifically track with heavier rail. This modernization is one of the things that led to the rise of superpower steam locomotives and the early 284 Berkshires were a foreshadowing of what the future held for steam on American rails. While other locomotive builders were tinkering with novel ideas like compounds, cross compounds, and three-cylinder designs, Lyman decided to take a more direct approach, build a bigger boiler and a bigger firebox, then add a four-wheel trailer to carry the additional weight. The use of a mechanical stoker, which had been around for some time at this point, was able to satisfy the locomotive's appetite for coal. The result was a substantial improvement over the Mikado in efficiency, power, and speed. Ironically, it was the Mikado built by Lima for the New York Central 1922 that served as the basis for the first 284 Berkshire of 1924. You could say the Mike played a significant role in its own obsolescence. The first 284 was put through its paces on the Boston and Albany division of the New York Central in 1925. The Berkshire's ability to handle the line's 1.67% ruling grade westbound proved the 284 a superior freight hauler. With 2,296 tons in tow, the 284 was able to outpull and outrun the heavy Mikados of the New York Central. It's during this time that the 284 was named the Berkshire after the Berkshire Hills of western Massachusetts. While most railroads refer to the 284 as the Berkshire, there is one notable exception. The Chesapeake and Ohio called their 284s Kanawas, borrowing the name from the Kanawa River, which ran along their main line. Probably the best-known railroads for an affinity for Lima products in general, and Berkshires in particular, are the roads that comprise the Van Swearingen Railroad Empire. By 1930, the Van Swearingen brothers owned the Chesapeake and Ohio, the Nickel Plate, the Erie, and the Pear Marquette. In an effort to achieve standardization in locomotive designs among the Van Swearingen roads, an advisory mechanical committee was formed and charged with allocating motive power to the various properties. Even after the threat of an antitrust lawsuit broke up the Van Swearingen Empire, the individual railroads remained loyal to Lima and the 284 Berkshire. The Nickel Plate Road remained loyal to steam and fast freight service longer than most and ordered its last batch of 10 284s in 1948. This would include the last new steam locomotive built by Lima, Berkshire No. 779. In the first decade of the 20th century, railroads hesitated to adopt large locomotives due to potential weight and clearance restrictions, and since passenger cars were still of the lightweight wooden variety, 
the 462 Pacifics were still able to move passenger trains at respectable speeds. By 1910, the Chesapeake and Ohio found it had the double-head passenger trains operating over the Allegheny Mountains, which prompted the railroad to look for an upgrade to its motive power for passenger operations. In 1911, the Chesapeake and Ohio took delivery of two 482s from Alco, making it the first railroad to adopt the type. The Chesapeake and Ohio design combined the best qualities of the Mikado and the Pacific, eight drive wheels for better traction, and a four-wheel pilot for better front end stability at high speeds. The 284 became known as the Mountain Type, presumably because it was intended to operate through the mountainous territory on the Chesapeake and Ohio. From 1911 to 1923, the Chesapeake and Ohio would only acquire 10 482s, a very small number compared to the fleet of mountains that would be amassed by other railroads. The Mountain was slow to catch on since most railroads were still satisfied with their Mikes and Pacifics, but by the mid-teens, the 482 began gaining popularity since fast freight service was becoming popular. Over the coming decades, 2400 482 Mountains would be built due to the fact that it was a viable dual-service locomotive. The Mountain didn't quite dethrone the Pacific like the Berkshire supplanted the Mikado. However, some railroads, like the New York Central, would develop the Mountain into an exceptional passenger locomotive. Although the 482 would remain in production into the mid-1940s, its numbers would amount to less than one-third the number of Pacifics, and the Pacific, like the Mountain, would also endure until the end of the steam era. The 484 Northern was the logical progression of the 482 Mountain. The Northern takes its name from the Northern Pacific Railroad, which was the first railroad to roster the 484. Just as the Hudson was simultaneously and independently developed by the Milwaukee Railroad and the New York Central, the Northern came into being through independent efforts of Alco and Baldwin. Even though the 484 is commonly known as the Northern, the type has gone by other names. A number of railroads bestowed their own moniker on the 484. The Chesapeake and Ohio called their 484s Greenbriars, the New York Central chose the Niagara lexicon, while the Norfolk and Western simply referred to theirs as J's, since the Norfolk and Western's 484s comprised the J class. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe decided to call them Heavy Mountains, or New Mountains, since the 484 was, after all, an improvement on the 482 mountain type. The first Northern built by Alco arrived on the Northern Pacific in 1927. These locomotives featured very large fireboxes suitable for burning soft, low-grade coal and able to make especially long runs between coaling stops. The 284s quickly proved themselves in heavier passenger service and were assigned to trains running between St. Paul, Minnesota and Livingston, Montana. A distance of about a thousand miles made this the world's longest uninterrupted run for a steam locomotive. In short, the Northern was able to out-Hudson the Hudson. The Northern Pacific's 484s were not only the first of the type, but in 1930, another 484 would join the roster featuring a technology that wasn't exactly new, but it would be the first time it would be applied to a steam locomotive. In 1930, Timken, a roller bearing manufacturer, looked to the railroads as a new market in, in which to increase sales. Convinced that roller bearings could significantly increase a locomotive's efficiency, Timken approached several railroads offering to retrofit existing locomotives with roller bearings. But since the railroads were hesitant to embrace new technology, all offers were refused. Refusing to take no for an answer, Timken went to Alco and had a demonstrator 484 designed and built to incorporate roller bearings on the axles, running gear, and anything else to which a roller bearing could be applied. The new locomotive was quite a sight to behold. Painted green with gold stripes and given the road number 1111, it was nicknamed the Four Aces, complete with playing card symbols, spade, heart, diamond, and club displayed on the sides of the sandbox. The tender had the name Timken emblazoned on its side, so there was no mistaking this locomotive for any other. The four aces would spend the next 21 months barnstorming the U.S., being th put through its paces on 13 different railroads. It performed well pulling passenger as well as freight trains, while attaining a top speed of 88 miles per hour. The four aces also managed to haul a 132-car coal train up a 2% grade. After 100,000 miles of punishment, four aces' bearings showed no significant signs of wear. Timken's investment paid off, and soon roller bearings were being applied to new locomotives. Some railroads even retrofitted existing locomotives. As for the four aces, the locomotive's firebox was damaged while running on the Northern Pacific. So the railroad bought the locomotive, numbered it 2626, and added it to its fleet of 484s. Number 2626 would go on to serve for another 25 years before being retired in 1958.
When diesel locomotives first appeared, most railroads didn't see them as viable options to replace steam power. However, by the 1940s, things had changed to the point where locomotive builders like Baldwin were looking for ways to prolong the dominance of steam power on the nation's railroads. One of the most well-known of the novel approaches was the Pennsylvania Railroad's lone S2 steam turbine. The S2 resulted from a collaboration between Baldwin and Westinghouse Electric in 1944. Due to wartime restrictions on lightweight steel alloys, the locomotive required a six-wheel pilot truck as well as a six-wheel trailer to carry the additional weight. The result was a 686 wheel configuration that at first glance looked like any other steam locomotive, but a closer look would reveal that this was no ordinary machine. Instead of relying on the usual method of steam propulsion, the S2 was equipped with two steam turbines, one for running forward and a smaller one for running in reverse. Superheated steam at a rate of 2,000 pounds per hour was required by the large turbine. To meet the demand for steam, an enormous firebox with a great area of 120 square feet was required, along with the aforementioned six-wheel trailer to carry the weight. The forward turbine could run at 9,000 RPM and produce 6,000 horsepower, while the reversing turbine could produce 1,500 horsepower at 8,300 RPM. A safety interlock system ensured the forward turbine could only be switched on when the reversing turbine was switched off. The S2 was originally intended to be a dual-service locomotive, but was used primarily in passenger service between Crestline, Ohio, and Chicago, Illinois. The shortcomings of the S2 materialized rather quickly. Since road conditions didn't allow the locomotive to operate at its maximum efficiency at all times, the overall efficiency suffered as a result. At speeds under 30 miles per hour, the volume of steam and fuel required was excessive compared to conventional steam locomotives. However, at speeds above 30 miles per hour, the 32 was more economical in terms of fuel consumption. The increased fuel consumption at low speeds caused the firebox to run hotter than usual. The extreme heat would eventually cause stay bolts to break and further contribute to the S2's reputation for being a maintenance nightmare. By 1947, a series of events would lead to the S2's demise. A decrease in ridership on passenger trains, an increase in coal prices, and the emergence of diesel locomotives made for an uncertain future for the S2. These things coupled with the high operating and maintenance costs resulted in the S2 never being duplicated and withdrawn from service in 1949 and ultimately scrapped in 1952. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. And once again, my name's Steve, and thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.